Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Danger Boys podcast. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, but before we get into that, just uh, a few quick notes. Um, so, I guess it's been a while since I've uploaded an episode, right? Um, now I've just been crazy busy with work, and so you know, I've finally been able to find some time uh, to, to do another one of these episodes. And I figured it was a good time uh, to cover the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, this is going to be a two-part episode, maybe even a three-part, depending on how long, um, the second part, uh, proves to be. Uh, so if you are watching this, uh, at release, there's a good chance the second and third episode are not out yet. Um, but if you want to go ahead and hit that subscribe button, um, so that way you get notified whenever the second part of the series drops, um, and if you're watching this in the future and the second episode is already out, the second part is already out, um, look down in the description. There should be a link to a playlist with all of the episodes, and you should be able to watch the other parts there. All right, so I guess let's get started. So a little bit of context before the Battles of Gettysburg. Uh, we get fully into it. So it's July 1st to July 4th. 1863 is whenever the battle takes place and the last time we talked about the civil war um we were talking about the uh 1861 and 1862 campaigns um these armies are significantly larger uh than those forces that we talked about um at that time in the early 1860s um and most of these men who are fighting at this point have been in the military for um, a significant period of time. You know, there are still some uh, fresh troops uh, among the ranks on both sides, but the majority of the fighting force is made up of veterans at this point. So, let's talk about the Army of Northern Virginia in the spring of 1863, right? So, in the spring of 1863, uh, General Lee is in charge of the Army of Northern Virginia, um, and there is a battle in May 1863, the Battle of Chancellorsville, in which the Army of the Northern Virginia won. Um, if you look at this map on the right-hand side of the screen, right above Richmond, if you go straight north, there's a town called Fredericksburg, which is an, a site of another very famous battle. Uh, just west of Fredericksburg, there's a small town called Chancellorsville. It's not on this map, but it's north of Charlottesville. And uh, we're not going to get into the uh, details of the uh, Battle of Chancellorsville. We'll save that for another episode. Um, but importantly, Stonewall Jackson, the uh, famous uh, Confederate commander, is killed uh, during the fighting at Chancellorsville. So uh, General Lee loses a very important commander. This leaves Lieutenant General James Longstreet in command of the First Corps and Lieutenant General Richard Ewell and Lieutenant General Ambrose Hill, better known as A.P. Hill, in command of the 2nd and 3rd Corps, respectively. Uh, the army in total after the Battle of Chancellorsville is around 75,000 men. Um, now, Lee, he wants to use the momentum from the Battle of Chancellorsville uh, to begin an invasion and to put pressure onto the north. Um, the entire uh, war up until this point has mainly been fought in the South, and so Lee sees this as a good opportunity to take the fighting to the Union. Um, his end goal is most likely Harrisburg and Philadelphia um, to try and put pressure on uh, large northern cities so that way the civilian population will put pressure on the politicians to... Uh, create some form of peace negotiations. Um, and of course, along with James Longstreet, Richard Yule, and A.P. Hill, Jeb Stewart is in command of the Cavalry Division. And I point out Jeb Stewart here because he is actually going to play a very pivotal role in the coming days. Um, and then just as far as if you want to look up to the, to the top uh, right screen next to Lee, um, this is a map showing the Shenandoah Valley. So Chancellorsville is over here in Virginia where I'm moving my mouse. And you can see across these mountains is the Shenandoah Valley. So Lee wins his victory and then he moves his army behind these mountains and begins marching north 
to Maryland and eventually Pennsylvania. And you can see here too, the commanders are pictured, Longstreet, Yule, and A.P. Hill. Now, let's talk about the Army of the Potomac, right? So, uh, the Army of the Potomac lost the Battle of Chancellorsville. And uh, during the Battle of Chancellorsville, uh, the general in charge of the Army of the Potomac is Major General Joseph Hooker. Now, Hooker and uh, Abraham Lincoln have not been seeing eye-to-eye -eye very well. Um, and so... Uh, Lincoln is almost looking for an excuse to replace Hooker. Hooker is liked by the men. You know, his, his men like him, but uh, Abraham Lincoln does not. So, <clears throat> after the Battle of Chancellorsville, and Lee begins moving north through the Shenandoah Valley, if you look to the right, top right, you'll see another map. And there's a lot of lines. It's very confusing, but the important thing to remember is that on the left side, on the west side, towards West Virginia, is Lee, and he is moving north with his divisions. And then to the east of that, um, closer to Washington, D.C., is Hooker. Uh, he is moving north following Lee. And they are getting into some, some minor skirmishes. Um, not, uh, not any huge battles, but, you know, um, 5,000, 10,000 men meeting, um, crossing paths, shooting it out for an afternoon, and then continuing to move north. Um, now, Hooker's army is larger than Lee's, and there's also more corps. Um, whereas Lee has three corps commanders, uh, plus General Jeb Stewart, Hooker has eight corps and has over 100,000 men, so about uh, 25,000 more men than Lee does. And there's going to be a lot of names that we're going to be going over today and in the second part of this video um there are a lot of names in the battle of gettysburg um i'm going to do my best to try and uh what i'm looking for um <laughs> i guess reinforce i guess reinforce or point out point out and reinforce the names that i feel are most important and influential um, but we're going to go real quickly through here, all the Corps commanders, just to give us some idea of who's out there, and some of these names may be familiar, um, and maybe not. So, the first Corps, uh, Major General F. Reynolds, John F. Reynolds, uh, the second Corps, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock, the third Corps, uh, Major General Dan Sickles, uh, the fifth Corps, who, uh, is at the Battle of Chancellorsville, led by Major General George Meade, um, George Sykes actually replaces Meade on June 28th whenever Meade is made commander of the Army of the Potomac and Joseph Hooker is relieved. Um, the 6th Corps is led by Major General John Sedgwick. The 11th Corps, Major General Oliver Hodes Howard. The 12th Corps, Major General Henry Slocum. And a Cavalry Corps is led by Major General Alfred Pleasanton and Artillery Brigade. General Henry Jackson commands the artillery. Now, uh, again, this map up on the top right next to Hooker, um, there's a lot of lines and there's a lot of uh, different information going on, but an important thing to look at is that above Washington, D.C., there's this little red line, this little red dashed line that goes all the way up the eastern seaboard, all the way up into uh, eventually Harrisburg here at the north, a little south of Harrisburg. Um, this is Jeb Stewart. Now, Jeb Stewart, like I said, is the commander of Lee's cavalry. And we're going to get into why Jeb Stewart being on the wrong side of the army is going to be very, very important. So, Jeb Stewart's fatal mistake, right? So, leading up to the Battle of Gettysburg, like I said, Lee is moving his brigades north. A.P. Hill, Longstreet, Yule. Um, they are moving north up to Chambersburg and into the Cumberland Valley. Well, while they're moving north, uh, Union Ge General David M. Gregg's cavalry under Major General Alfred, right? So Alfred is the, the, the main commander that oversees all the cavalry and David Gregg's uh, divisions under him uh, engage with two of Stewart's brigades in East 
uh, Uppersville, Virginia, on June 21st, 1863. Um, both sides end up uh, trying to outflank the other. They're trying to get around each other's flanks, right? That's how you win a battle in, in the Civil War is by outflanking your enemy. But being as they're both cavalry, they're both, they, you know, they both move very quickly. No one really gets an advantage. Stuart retreats to higher ground outside of the town called Ashby's Gap. And then Greg, at the end of the day, uh, disengages Stuart and begins to move north following Hooker's army, um, soon to be General Meade's army. Well, after uh, Greg disengages, Stuart realizes that he can go south and east and get behind Hooker and on the other side. Now, this puts him closer to Washington, D.C., but uh, completely out of communication with Lee and the rest of the army. Um, this is huge. This is, this is, uh, so the cavalry act as the advance guard of the army, right? The cavalry, they're on horseback. They can ride through and they can spy on the enemy forces. They can understand where they're moving, how many of them, you know, where at. Without Jeb Stewart, uh, General Lee ends up being relatively blind, um, going into the days leading up to and the first few uh, battles of Gettysburg. Um, Gettysburg is actually a collection of, of multiple battles. And so um, the beginning of, of the, the fight, Jeb Stewart was not there, and Lee did not know who he was facing at the time. Um, so let's talk about Lieutenant General James Longstreet, right? I think Longstreet's one of these uh, important... Uh, commanders that we should be paying attention to. Uh, Longstreet, along with a spy by the name of Henry Harrison. I believe that Henry Harrison deserves to get some attention. So, who was Henry Harrison, right? Henry Harrison was an actor from Nashville who had joined the Confederate Army as a volunteer and quickly became a spy um, for the Confederate Army. And in 1863, uh, he met Longstreet during the Battle of Suffolk and, you know, uh, Longstreet liked him, took a liking to him, and uh, Henry began spying for Longstreet, right? He would, he would bring information to Longstreet or Longstreet's men, and he quickly gained a, a reputation for having accurate information. Um, he knew what he was talking about. And so on June 28th in 1863, when Longstreet was uh, north and west of Gettysburg by about uh, 15 miles, um, a little less than that. The, the divisions were spread out quite a bit, but, um, yeah, just, just a, a day's march outside of Gettysburg. Yeah, so Harrison arrives at Longstreet's, uh, Longstreet's field office, uh, with news that Hooker had been replaced by Meade. So, like I said, without Jeb Stewart, um, and, you know, someone to tell them, uh, James Longstreet and Lee have no idea that the, the commanders have changed position, although they, they would have found out soon enough, but still. Um, but yeah, the hooker has been replaced. That eight Union Corps was less than 30 miles away, with advanced cavalry no more than one hard day's ride away. One hard day's ride away. Oof, tongue twister. And that Jeb Stewart was raiding towns on his way to Harrisburg, right? So Henry Harrison comes to James Longstreet, and this is all bad news, right? Uh, the, the Confederates are moving north, um, facing relatively uh, weak resistance. And um, they think that their pathway up and through Pennsylvania will be relatively unhindered. They have no idea that the entire Army of the Potomac is uh, basically a, a stone's throw away on June 28th. So how does Lee react to Harrison's decision or information? What's Lee's decision on Harrison's information? Um, well, uh, so whenever Harrison told Longstreet, right? Longstreet sent a messenger. Um, you know, these camps were, you know, a few miles apart. And so in order to get message to Lee, uh, Longstreet had to send a messenger. And this messenger arrives to Lee and it reports to him that, hey, uh, Hooker's been replaced, Meade's in charge, and there's eight corps um, getting ready to, uh, you know, is preparing on their doorsteps. Well, at first, Lee did not believe the report. He said, you know, why should I trust this actor? Uh, he is not uh, 
I don't know who he is. I don't trust him. Jeb Stewart is who I trust, and I have not heard from Jeb Stewart. If we were in danger, if if there really were eight corps out there, if, if the Army of the Potomac was that close, Jeb Stewart would not have left us. They, he would have stayed near us, and he would have given us this information. But later on that night, on June 28th, uh, Longstreet uh, goes to Lee himself. They have a face-to-face conversation, and Lee is convinced that Harrison's information is accurate. Oh, man. Just had a coughing fit. I apologize for that. Um, so... Once Longstreet reassures Lee and Lee uh, believes the information, Lee gives the order for his army of Northern Virginia to consolidate and converge on Cashtown, PA, about eight miles outside of Gettysburg. Now, if you look down here at this map in the bottom right corner, you can see Gettysburg out here in the middle and Cashtown slightly to the west of that. That is where Lee is converging. And... Lee does not plan on arriving in Gettysburg. He does not plan an assault in Gettysburg. He, he does not know the land, um, being from Virginia and uh, not growing up in the area. He does not know the land. Um, he does not expect a fight. He doesn't turn down the fight, he, he, you know, but he, he would, would have rather choose to fight on a different day or perhaps a different battlefield. But um, the roads in the area pretty much all led to Gettysburg. So if you were traveling down a road in this part of Pennsylvania, eventually you were going to reach uh, Gettysburg, and that's actually what happened. That's how these two armies collided, almost by chance. So we're going to talk about John Buford on July 1st. This is the um, first battle, the first contact of the Battle of Gettysburg. So... To the north and to the west of the town of Gettysburg stands three ridges, right? They, the, these ridges are called Her Ridge, McPherson Ridge, and Seminary Ridge. Um, now, Gettysburg, uh, being where it's located at in the foothills of the Appalachia Mountains, um, <clears throat> it's a very hilly landscape. And Buford knows this. Buford knows that this is very hilly landscape, and the most important place to hold is the hills, right? If you if you want to win a battle, the high ground is very, very important. <clears throat> and so behind Buford are three bigger hills, the Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge, and Culp's Hill. Now, Buford knows that behind him, so he's the advanced, like I said, the, the cavalry uh, is the advanced guard, and John Buford is head of the cavalry, uh, or head of a cavalry division. Um, he knows how important those hills are. He knows that if he, he has to hold his position uh, so the uh, Union reinforcements can come in behind him and uh, sit on those hills. So if you look down here at the uh, bottom picture, uh, you can see the map of Gettysburg and the first... Uh, contact that is made by the infantry. So, um, I just lost my mouse. Okay, found the mouse. I'm sorry about that. Um, you can see down here, you got Hancock um, Division. He is holding uh, from Cemetery Hill uh, over to uh, Culp's Hill. This is kind of that area. And you can see the advance guard up here, Reynolds, Doubleday, Howard. Uh, these are the infantry brigades that move in uh, behind Buford and allow him to retreat. So on the afternoon of Ju- June 1st, 1863, right? So in the morning, Buford um, is holding strong, but he's, you know, he's suffering a lot of casualties. At first, the Confederates who first arrived and engaged in Buford thought that they were uh, Union brigades. They thought that they were infantry, but it was actually dismounted cavalry. Buford uh, dismounted his horse and they made their stand. Now, suffering major losses, the uh, Union 1st and the Union 11th Corps arrive under John Reynolds, and they take the hills that Buford was guarding. Uh, Reynolds is killed early in this engagement. So Reynolds brings his men up. Unfortunately, he is shot and killed. And Buford is now able to disengage and fall back, and he will spend the rest of the Battle of Gettysburg at the rear of the Union um, 
holding up supply lines from the uh, the rest of the army. Uh, so A.P. Hill and Richard Yule's 2nd and 3rd Corps, the, the uh, Confederate commanders, they arrive and they overwhelm the Union's 1st and 11th Corps. And so they actually push uh, Reynolds' men back across Gettysburg, through the town, and onto the hills of Cemetery Hill. Um, Lee, who had arrived um, in the afternoon of June 1st, after the fighting had begun, gave the order to Hill and Yule to take the hills if practical. Practicable. Practical. <laughs> um, and Hill and Yule felt that it was not. It was not practicable. Um, the men that they were fighting with were tired, and the assault on the hills would uh, prove to be fatal. Uh, they felt that it would be better to wait until the next day when if reinforcements arrived and they could push Meade off of the hill. Like I said earlier, uh, this engagement at Gettysburg, this, this battle that was slowly unfolding in front of them, uh, was not planned by Lee. He, he didn't plan to fight at Gettysburg. He didn't really want to fight at Gettysburg. But he knew that he was on a roll, right? He, he won at Chancellorsville. He had the Union on the run. And if he could push General Meade off the hills and he could uh, take those for himself, it would be on to Washington and eventual victory. So Lee, although not desperate, um, is willing to sacrifice quite a bit to try and get a victory today. You can see down here in the bottom right corner, up here on top of the hill, this is Cemetery Hill, and below are the Confederates who are trying to take the hill. And this is obviously an artist uh, rendering, but you can see how hilly it is, and imagine too, the middle of July, you have all of your gear on, you have your musket, you're wearing um, heavy uh, clothing because, you know, they didn't have Under Armour back in the 1863s, you know, you're out there wearing wool and cotton, very hot, very sweaty, 90 degrees, um, there's a lack of water, and so people are dying of heat exhaustion as well as bullets. Um, and of course the Union have an easier time just sitting behind the ramparts and firing down. So let's talk about uh, Meade's defensive strategy, right? So thanks in long part to, uh, in most part to uh, Buford and his cavalry, and uh, the 1st uh, and 11th Corps of the Army, uh, whenever Meade and the rest of his men arrive overnight, you know, in, into the late night of uh, July 2nd, or July 1st, in the very, very morning of, you know, July 1st, uh, no, backwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> let me just start over. <laughs> so, on, at the end of the day, on July 1st, right, uh, most of uh, Meade's rest of his army arrive, right, and they are able to fill in along the hill that uh, was being protected earlier on in the day by the 1st and the 11th Corps. Um, and he creates a fish hook, right? So down here in the bottom right, uh, you can see this map. So over here you have Culp's Hill, where Slocum is on Culp's Hill. Um, and then Howard and Newton and Hancock hold along Cemetery Ridge, or uh, Cemetery Hill, Cemetery Ridge is out here, Cemetery Ridge, uh, Hill over here, and then all the way down through Sickles uh, to a place called Little Round Top. Um, so that's the uh, Union defense, right? We're going to create this fish hook, right, where you come down and you hook around, and this will be strong, it will, we'll use the high ground to our advantage, and we will repel the Confederates. Well, <clears throat> uh, Lee's uh, uh, offensive plan is to have a three-part attack. First, uh, he wants Yule to engage with Slocum on the right side, and this will draw the attention away from Longstreet, who will be attacking the left flank. Uh, and then A.P. Hill will assault the middle whenever Longstreet fires his first shot. So the idea from Lee is that Meade has the strong defensive position. We are going to probe at all sides of it at different times. And as Longstreet, or as Meade 
moves his men to reinforce different weak spots, we will be able to take advantage of that, overwhelm the Union um, from the flank, and rout them. Well, it's a great idea on paper. However, uh, as we will see, there are some uh, not only flaws, but the determination of the Union to not give up their land uh, makes all of the difference. So that's, um, let's talk about the Peach Orchard, right? There is going to be, like I said, within the Battle of Gettysburg, there are um, hundreds of small engagements that play out over the day and the, the, the three days. There are several engagements, and I think that there are several of them that are important enough to point out. And the first of those that we'll, we'll talk about is the Peach Orchard. So, uh, third Corps commander Daniel Sickles, right? So we'll, we'll we'll go back to here. So you can see on this map in the bottom right corner that Sickles is down here next to Hancock, and you can see his line is moving forward. That should not be right. This line should be straight from from Howard Newton to Hancock all the way down in a straight line, but Sickles moves forward. Why is that? Well, in front of him in his position uh, that he is currently standing in, he sees three hills that are bigger than the hill that he is on. And he says, okay, well, I have artillery, I have cannons, and cannons should be on the highest hill possible. I'm going to go and move forward and take those hills. So, Sickles orders the 3rd Michigan, the 68th Pennsylvania, and the 141st Pennsylvania to advance into the Peach Orchard and to take the high ground. Now, just as Sickles was getting into position, Longstreet launched his attack, right? A.P. Hill uh, is witnessing Longstreet's attack, and he begins his as well. So at first, Longstreet is surprised to find Dan Sickles um, this far advanced, and uh, Sickles fires into Longstreet's flank, right? As uh, he's climbing up the hill, Longstreet is, he uh, gets surprised and is fired upon by Sickles. However, Longstreet quickly understands what's happening and sees the position as it what, what it was, which was weak, because again, Sickles had left the line exposed behind him. If Longstreet can get around uh, Sickles, he can force the uh, brigade or the, the, uh, the men to surrender and then continue on breaking the Union line. Um, so Longstreet moves his flank around moves his lines, readjusts, and soon outflanks Sickles. Uh, this is some of the ba bloodiest battles. Uh, bla buddy this is some of the bloodiest fighting in the entire Battle of Gettysburg and in the entire war. Uh, in some divisions, casualties uh, could reach 80% of a division. If you go marching into battle with 800 guys or 1,000 guys in your division, only 100 or 200 may come back. Um, of course, a lot of these divisions were smaller than those numbers. Some divisions only had 100 men, only had 200 men, uh, but still losing 80 of 100 men uh, due to either death, capture, or wounded um, certainly is a lot. Um, Sickles is injured in the fighting, but his men are able to stay organized, and they're able to slowly fall back to the high ground that they should have stayed on in the beginning. A um, 1,000 men uh, roughly were killed um, on both sides in less than three hours. Uh, this is an extremely high casualty rate. It is some of the fiercest and bloodiest fighting of the entire Civil War. Now, uh, could have been a, a major, major... A uh, mistake for the Union had uh, certain other men who saw what Sickles was doing. Uh, certain commanders we'll get into in a little bit saw what Sickles had done and uh, reacted accordingly. This perhaps could have changed the entire battle. Fortunately for the Union, it did not. Now, let's talk about the left of uh, Sickles' advanced position, right? To the left is a place called Devil's Den. Now, Devil's Den, as you can see from this picture in the top right, is a collection of boulders, um, is really what it is. It is rocky terrain. It is hard terrain. 
It is hilly, and it is uh, nasty. That is how the men describe it, as nasty, horrible rocks. So Major General John Hood of the Confederacy, um, he spends the uh, day of July 1st uh, marching hard to try and get to Gettysburg uh, in time to help support General Lee. Um, and like I said, middle of July in Pennsylvania, it's very, very hot. You're looking at, you know, almost 100 degrees. So these men are marching all day, and they arrive in the morning and afternoon at a place called Devil's Den. Um, now, like I said, Devil's Den is a collection of boulders. It's very difficult ground. It's very hard ground. It is not where people want to be fighting, especially after a hard day's march. General John Hood orders a 20-minute bombardment uh, to uh, try to dislodge some unions from their position. However, after that bombardment was launched, uh, the Confederates uh, marched 3,100 men uh, across the field and towards the rocks. Now, in the defensive position, holding the rocks, there are 2,400 Union men under Brigadier General John Hobart Ward. Um, now, these 3,000 rebels were made up mostly of Alabamians and Texans. Uh, the Alabamians and Texans actually uh, stormed the rocks, and they won. They won the rocks for a short period of time uh, while the Union fought to reclaim the rocks, uh, and they eventually did. Um, this is Devil's Den is the site of very much flipping and flopping. One side would take the rocks, and then in the next you know few hours, and the other side would take it, and back and forth it went all day. Um, eventually, though, the Union uh, line uh, was reinforced, and the Federals were pushed back. Um, and again, we're looking at about 1,800 casualties for both sides. And again, in total. Uh, 2,400 on the Union side and 3,100 on the Rebel side. Uh, these are significant casualties. These are not uh, uh, small numbers by any you know any point of the imagination. And this is, like I said at the very beginning, um, partly to do with the time frame, 1863. These men are not green. They are not... Uh, the, the, the weak and the cowardly and those who would not stand and fight have either fled already or are dead. And so these are truly the uh, strongest fighting men of both armies. And so losing uh, 20, 30, or 40 percent of your men, uh, these men do not break. They continue to stand there and fight, um, suffering more casualties, but winning the day in the end. That's why these battles are so uh, bloody and why the casualty rates are so high. Not to mention, uh, not all those casualties are, like I said, are from gunfire. A lot of them are heat stroke or dehydration or illness. Um, you know, you get shot and you're weak and you're dehydrated and maybe the wound wasn't bad enough to kill you if you were fully healthy, but in your weakened state, uh, people found a hard time going on. And you can see here in this picture, uh, there are several uh, combatants who are dead over the rocks um, in this rather crazy fighting. Um, nightmarish, if you will. Devil's Den is an appropriate name. Okay, so now um, I know we talked a lot about it. Let's just do a quick overview of the map that we're looking at of the situation. So you can see here with Ward. Um, Ward took over after... Uh, Sickles was killed. So you can see this advanced position over here in Devil's Den. You can see, um, like I said, throughout the day, this line was pushed back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Um, and so over here is the uh, Peach Orchard and then Devil's Den. And then over here is Little Round Top. So again, the line, the, the, the Union line should go from uh, all the way up here on the left side down through... Straight line all the way to Little Round Top. This should all be one continuous line, but Sickles moving forward uh, severely hinders that. Um, and then we can see down here, this is where we'll be going next, Little Round Top, Vincent, and you can see here the 20th ME, 20th Maine. We'll be talking about them uh, here. 
So, in the afternoon, right, or the day, I guess, of July 2nd, um, shortly after uh, the fighting starts at uh, Devil's Den and uh, the Peach Orchard, uh, Colonel Strong Vincent of the 3rd Brigade has about 3,000 men, and he hears news, right? The, the news is being spread around by the Union commanders. Sickles has left his position, and reinforcements need to be brought up to hold the line. Um, now, Colonel uh, Vincent was not told directly by a superior commander that he needs to get into position. He just took that initiative on his own. He, he heard the news that uh, he must that reinforcements were needed, and he took the initiative uh, to close that gap. And the Little Round Top uh, was the left flank of the fish hook. It was the far left reaching flank of the fish hook, and so very important that it be held. Now, the 20th Maine, like I talked, you know, we just touched on it, I just showed you a picture of where they were located on the far left flank. They were the last line of defense um, from the Confederates getting around uh, the flank. Uh, Joshua Chamberlain is told that he must hold to the last, right? The last men, you must not retreat. So with 385 men who have been ro running low on ammunition, right, they're, they're not very well stocked, um, they hold the ground of Little Round Top as the Confederate 4th, 15th, and 47th Alabama under uh, Brigadier General Ed Evander M. Law march through the woods up into Vincent's position, right? Vincent, strong Vincent, has his line. We'll go back here for a second. Vincent has his entire line here. And you can see the 15th, the 47th, the 4th Alabama, and there are some Texas brigades as well um, are going to be pushing up the hill. So, uh, like I said, running low on ammunition. Um, for 90 minutes, the 20th Maine and the 83rd Pennsylvania uh, refused uh, two charges that came up the hill from the Confederates. They would... The Confederates would get together, right? They would group up, and then they would run up the hill, and the 20th Maine and the 83rd Pennsylvania would shoot down the hill into them, and uh, the Confederates would retreat a bit, reorganize, and push back up the hill. However, after 90 minutes of this, um, Chamberlain, Chamberlain knows that he is running out of ammo. He has no more ammo to shoot. Many of his men, um, you know, you... You, you're going around to each of your fallen comrades and you're trying to get every scrap of ammo that you can find. Uh, some people resort to using rocks, small pebbles they'll put inside of their gun to try and launch uh, something at the enemy. So, knowing this, knowing that his men are almost out of ammo, Chamberlain gives the orders to uh, engage their bayonets, right? To, to equip bayonets. And so... Chamberlain moves his army. He moves, or not his army, his, his men. He moves his line. He readjusts. He brings out his left flank, which was pushed back. He, he, had, he had had the left flank fall back a bit as they were facing pressure. He then brought them forward, and in a giant swinging maneuver, uh, orders his men to go down the hill and meet the Confederates as they were coming up. As the Confederates uh, began their third assault or fourth assault, uh, depending on who you <laughs> read historically. Um, different accounts ex exist of the day. Um, but after a few assaults, uh, Chamberlain gives the orders to charge, uh, charge down the hill. And so the 20th Maine and the 83rd Pennsylvania uh, do. And several of Colonel Vincent's men, who upon seeing Chamberlain running down the hill, decided that they should join as well, and soon uh, most of Strong's army uh, brigade, excuse me, most of his 3,000 men were running down this hill, bayonets uh, at the ready, and uh, winning the day, forcing the Confederates to retreat for the last time on Little Round Top. Um, and so, like I said, they, they, they disperse, they run down the hill, they disperse the men, they capture those who were too weak to uh, run away or uh, perhaps were just tired of fighting. And as they were 
Being led back, the, the POWs from the Confederate, the muskets were empty. The, the Union soldiers had no ammo. They, that's why they had to put on the bayonets. And so the Union, the Confederate soldiers, although they were beaten and probably would not have fought back anyways, um, could have, in theory, uh, at least escaped because they would not be shot in the back because, again, no ammo. Um, in 1893, for his courage on the battlefield, Chamberlain received a Medal of Honor. Um, now, as far as historical debate, as far as how important the Battle of Little Round Top is um, to the overall Battle of Gettysburg, um, that's debatable. It is, because had the... Uh, despite Chamberlain receiving the orders that he could not retreat, he had more help than he initially seemed. Not initially, um, when the skirmishing and then in the fighting first began at the beginning of the day, uh, there was no reinforcement. But as the day went on and we went later into the afternoon, um, more men did arrive from the Union side and Chamberlain was able to be reinforced and the position was strengthened. However, at the time during the battle, um, it was seen as very, very important. And so I think having that context um, helps us understand the battle a little better. And we'll talk about the losses. So the Union, right, they were they had a strong position. They were on top of the hill and they had rocks and they had, you know, uh, different types of defensive positioning, they only lose 565 of the 3,000 men that went into battle on that day. The Confederates, on the other hand, lose close to 11,000 to, or 1,200 of its original 4,864 men. So, uh, the Confederate having almost, uh, 2,000 more men than the Union lose about 500 more. Um, and that's, of course, you know, like I said, running up the hill, being tired, being exhausted from all the marching uh, is not easy. So here we are again, and just we're going to reiterate this map one more time, just so that way we fully understand what's going on here. So again, Little Round Top is over here, and you can see this is what I was talking about. A uh, weed was coming in and reinforcing uh, Vincent and the line uh, as it was uh, weakened uh, due to Sickles' uh, forward push. So he was being reinforced. Uh, he just didn't know it at the time. Um, and you can see here uh, the Texas and Alabama brigades up the hill. Now there's a, a thing here called Round Top, Big Round Top, as it's known. Now this hill is trees and rocks, and it is not practicable to take at all. There's there's no real uh, uh, strategic advantage taking these hills, so that's why uh, the Confederates had no ish, uh, no uh, desire to take those hills. There was no reason to. It was pointless. So let's talk about Culp's Hill, right? So this is on the right side of the Union now. We talked about the left flank. We're going to talk about the right. Um, the Union right was uh, bombarded by cannon fire uh, from Yule's 32 guns and AP Hill's 55 guns uh, for two hours at an extreme range, right? Uh, Yule and AP's guns are pretty much as far back as they can be, and they are firing into Culp's Hill to very little effect due to how far away they are. And uh, this is at first because Yule is having the understanding with the plan that he was shown earlier from Lee, right, that AP and Yule are going to engage, and then Longstreet's going to engage, and then, you know, this whole idea. But call, uh, Yule is under the understanding that a, an actual assault is not going to happen. It's just going to be a military bombardment and an, an artillery bombardment, and then that will be the end of it. However, at 6 p.m., Yule understands his orders now, finally, that he is supposed to take the hills personally, to have his infantry march up the hill and take it. So, Yule gives instructions um, to his men, his brigades, that we should assault the, the, the Culp's Hill at 6 p.m., um, although Major General Edward Johnson and his brigade are still a mile behind Yule, 
uh, trying to catch up to the rest of the army. And this is in, in the evening of July 2nd. So although most of the armies had arrived and, and most of the total force had arrived by the morning of July 2nd, not all of them had. So Yule uh, assaults the hill with three-fourths of his total strength. Now, on July 1st, uh, the Union 12th Corps was initially stationed at the uh, Culp's Hill. Um, however, uh, whenever Longstreet launched his attack, Meade had moved the 12th Corps um, over to try and reinforce Longstreet, uh, the, the Sickles and, and the rest of the uh, Union left that we had just looked at. So, um, the, the, the 12th Corps leave behind uh, one of the uh, brigades, is the New York Brigade under General George Green. Uh, the rest of the men move to the center. Uh, Green uh, holds his position on Culp's Hill uh, for the morning and the afternoon while the 1st and the 11th Corps arrive to reinforce him. Now, the Confederates are able to take some of the foothills in front of Culp's Hill. They say this is very, very hilly terrain. There are hills everywhere. And in front of Culp's Hill, there are other hills, you know, little little em embankments, I suppose you would call them. The Confederates get that far, and in fact, they do at some point overwhelm some of the Union's men. They take the, the ramparts that the Union are behind. However, not enough of the Confederates get through, and the Union are able to consolidate and push the Confederate brigade commanders of Hayes and Avery um, off of the ramparts. Avery is wounded and lost about half of his men. And again, these are core... Uh, these are brigades with roughly, uh, you know, 500 to, you know, 1,300 men. So you're losing uh, anywhere from four to 12 or 800 men. Um, quite significant losses. Um, and again, it's not all just, you know, bullet wounds. It's not all getting shot by musket fire, um, heat stroke and starvation and everything else that could possibly kill a human was happening at the same time. So Jeb Stewart finally arrives, right? Jeb Stewart, we talked about him earlier. Jeb Stewart um, arrives at Gettysburg um, in the morning and the afternoon of July 2nd. Uh, Jeb Stewart arrives and he immediately goes to Lee's headquarters and he makes himself present for Lee. Now, the exact conversation that happened between these two men is not known because, uh, you know, it's, it's considered etiquette, if you will. You know, uh, Lee berating uh, Stewart and uh, would not be seen as appropriate to be, you know, quoted. But an observer uh, did quote Lee as saying, well, General Stewart, you are here at last, you know, and uh, from coming from General Lee. I'm sure his delivery was quite different than <laughs> than mine. Uh, but coming from Lee, this would be seen as a slight. You know, this would be seen, this is not a warm welcome. Oh, Jeb, you know, Jeb, it's good to see you again. I'm happy you're here. No, well, here you are, you're here. Like, I'm happy you're here, but you're here. Um, and the remaining conversation um, was described as painful beyond description. That is what Lee is doing to Jeb Stewart. He is berating him and, uh, you know letting him know that he messed up by not following the army and being uh, and, and informing Lee. Uh, Jeb Stewart is alleged to attempt to resign as commander. You know, after Lee berates him, he says, I'm, I'm sorry, General Lee, please remove me of command. I, I do not uh, deserve this title. Uh, Lee says, again, reportedly, uh, there is no time for this, right? Lee has no time for Jeb Stewart's apologies. He has no time for... Uh, him to say that he's sorry and whatnot. There's a battle to be won. Again, remember, this is this is in the middle of the, of the day, of July 2nd. A.P. Hill and Yule are assaulting uh, Culp's Hill. Longstreet is involved in some of the deadliest fighting of the entire war uh, in Devil's Den and the Peach Orchard and on top of Little Round Top. And so, Jeb Stewart, we have no time for this. We have no time for you to make your apologies uh, I need you to command the cavalry we have, and we have a battle to win. 
So this is uh, the end of the day on the, the the July second. That's how that's how we're gonna leave it. And like I said, we'll pick it up in part two. We'll go back and we will talk about Pickett's charge and the end of the Battle of Gettysburg in the next coming part. Um, so like I said, I appreciate you guys so much. Um, if you would like to subscribe, like, comment. Um, if you have any questions or opinions or want to have a discussion or whatever, uh, put it in the comments and I'll, uh, you know, I'll see it, I'll read it, and I'll comment back. So let's see, anything else? Any last notes? Uh, no, not really. I hope that the second part comes out in about a week. Um, if you're watching this, whenever it first comes out, hopefully that part will be done in the week. Um, but, uh, but if not, well, hey, it'll, it'll be out at some point, I promise. So, all right, I guess that's, I guess that's part one of a podcast done. Cool. Um, bye.